So we are now opening up to an official Q&A, although you were kind enough to start asking questions during the talk. So we ask you to please line up by the two mics, and I'm going to bring this one back to its own stand. Thank you. Is this working? So my question is, uh, Rossi's been talking lately about a frequency generator, and I'm wondering if that's related at all to your breathing phenomena. Well, first of all, Rossi is the master of misdirection. <laughs> I think he's brilliant, actually, and I just hope he has something, because if he has something, his uh, strategy is truly brilliant. And, and by keeping it ambiguous, by keeping it never certain, he avoids competition. People don't want to get in because they're not sure. And he avoids the evil eye of the Department of Energy. <laughs> He's got a nuclear uh, process. He's going to bring it to the United States. He's going to make a megawatt by a nuclear effect. <laughs> the only way he can possibly get away with that is if DOE doesn't believe it's true. <laughs> We've made tritium here on this campus, I'll tell you, a sin that we've committed. We have made tritium here on this campus. You may not make tritium without a DOE license. We have made it. We've published it. <laughs> DOE hasn't come knocking on my door because they don't believe it. <laughs> so the frequency generator, first of all, I would put a frequency generator in. And you need the uh, Dynamics, you need a flux condition. So I think a frequency generator of some sort inside would be a very clever way to goose this system and maybe make it controllable. So, um, yeah, I don't know, but, but it, could be, uh, it could be nothing. <laughs> but... Um, if he just wrapped it around the outside, I don't know what the frequency is, and he has a uh, Faraday cage. It's all metallically closed uh, thing, so how much of that frequency can possibly be getting into where the action is? Uh, unless he's put wires inside, but the photographs don't indicate that he's actually introducing it to the specimen. So at the moment I'm treating that as a red herring, but it's a, it's a, it's a profitable line of inquiry. Well, the question is, how did that develop from cold fusion? And I'm here to talk about cold fusion. It's, if, there, if, if Rossi and Piantelli are right, and if Fleischmann and Pons are right, which I believe, I'm not, I'm, I believe in the law of conservation of miracles. <laughs> I believe that if they're both right, then the underlying physics will be common. Yes, sir. You said that the sweet spot is 400. What happens no, at higher uh, temperatures? The case experiment, the sweet spot was 200. Uh, okay. Rossi, Piantelli, and company need to operate above 350, 400. Is, is there oh. any experiments that uh, are done at much higher temperatures? That Harder to work up higher. Uh, there were very early experiments done in molten salts at, I think, 650 degrees, which seemed to indicate that the effect works fine. And you're going to run out of... Uh, impetus, you know, as you get towards the melting uh, point, but um, it, this effect might very well work better at 650. It's just very difficult to work there. I was having a fantasy that you might somehow work together with NIF and work at millions of degrees. Millions of degrees, yeah. Well, that'd be hot fusion, and you'd get hot fusion products, and the principal problem of hot fusion it, it, and the, the, the contrast between cold fusion and hot fusion couldn't be more dramatic. Hot fusion is based on old physics, well understood. The physics was worked out in the 50s. There's nothing to it, really. It works. The sun works, OK. Hydrogen bombs. Hydrogen bombs work. But um, you always get the same product yield. You get uh, fast neutrons and tritium. And the, and the neutrons are a problem, uh, a, a, a dangerous problem. So. Well, I, I was just hoping you might get a, a higher efficiency or something. Yeah, well, I, you know, if I could get this thing to work at 
350, I'd be happy. At 600, 650, I'd be um, laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> Sir. Oh. Uh, in reading the papers that uh, Rossi had published, he was saying that there was transmutation of nickel into copper. But, but if you're producing uh, helium, aren't you also causing transmutation? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a semantic issue, yeah. And it, w well. We are producing new elements. Um, we are producing helium that could be transmutation. But uh, also, if he's using, say, a microwave apparatus, then the, 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 the tubular effect of that could be the conductor. It could be. No, no, it could be, absolutely. Uh, it's a property of helium-4 <clears throat> that if it's formed from two deuterons, uh, the excitation energy in helium-4 is way up there. And uh, it's particle unstable. And uh, that process is several orders of magnitude. <clears throat> Excuse me. That decay process would be several orders of magnitude greater than just producing helium-4. So you had nice mass spectroscopic line shapes for D2 and for helium-4. Did you look to see helium-3 or tritium? Well, helium-3 and, and, and tritium are very difficult to resolve one from the other. You can measure them in different experiments. And, and the, I, the first part of your statement, how the hell do you make something with a, an excitation of 24 uh, MeV uh, is the reason there are 500 theories of, in cold fusion. I mean, it's people uh, tr tr challenging well, it, that. It's, I, it's more puzzling if you make it, but don't make neutrons or well, protons. And we, we uh, protons we can't see. Uh, neutrons we could have seen. We have a health safety monitor of uh, neutrons. The, the neutrons that we produced at the time that the helium-4 was produced we're not at detectable levels. Typically, when neutrons are produced, they're about 10 orders of magnitude down on the uh, heat-producing reaction. So we might, that might have been, but with a normal branching ratio, you know, uh, conservation of uh, energy and angular momentum in a pairwise reaction, we absolutely didn't do that. We did produce helium-4. But, but the mass spectra, uh, there should be a mass-3 peak somewhere. Did you look yeah, for that? that? Yeah, we look for it. Um, that's, our better mass spec is really um, devoted to that task. It's measuring helium-3, helium-4, measuring the helium-3, helium-4 uh, ratios. Because not only is the absolute uh, concentration of helium-4 in the atmosphere well, very well known, it's, its isotopic uh, ratio is very well known. So we spend a lot of time looking at that ratio, and it's really tilts in that ratio which give us you know, indications and hope that one or other has been produced. Uh, in that first experiment, I can't remember anything about helium-3. Presumably it was looked for and not found, but we did look for tritium and didn't find it. And there weren't any neutrons. Sure. I'm curious, the palladium, at some point it just gets saturated and somehow you know, fails to continue to work. Um, have they looked very closely at its matrix with you know, whatever they can get, scanning, tunneling, microscopes, and seeing what's going on there? Um, yeah, we've looked but not learned a lot. And I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of my uh, sponsor's money on such post-test diagnostics. And we've seen everything you can possibly imagine. But... Um, what is, you know, what's systematically related to a successful cathode, an unsuccessful cathode, a cathode that worked for a while and failed? I, I don't know the answer. And part of the problem in the electrochemical system is that at the end of your experiment, no matter how careful you are in controlling the impurities in the system, your cathode gets buried deep under layers of, of uh, garbage that uh, dissolves up in the cell and transports to the cathode. And Electrochemistry is the perfect vacuum cleaner. It'll <laughs> suck up everything that's in the system, ultimately. Would, would uh, pressurization help uh, to saturate the, uh, the palladium and or nickel? Yeah, we that? did that. In the early days, we designed experiments, some running at uh, 1,500 PSI. One experiment ran at 10,000 PSI, and it was frightening. <laughs> but the gain that you get from pressure 
is small compared to the gain that you get from just doing your electrochemistry right. Electrochemistry is much more powerful in this regard. And the neutrons coming off, they're just very low energy. You say you put them in a cloud chamber, you're not getting a lot of energy. A Geiger counter is not going to pick up much uh, radioactivity? I don't, think, I don't think Piantelli in his cloud chamber was seeing neutrons. They attributed it to energetic uh, alphas and uh, uh, protons. Protons and alphas is what they saw. So, so, so a neutron, in other words, we can't put like a lithium blanket around to absorb the neutrons and get heat from that? N no. Well, um, the, I don't think Piantelli sees enough for that. Fortunately, it's cold, and you're thinking in hot fusion terms where the mm -hmm. energy release is prompt and large. Our energy release is, what? Well, actually, I... Small. It would be better in some ways if it was larger because it would make it much easier to demonstrate the effect. Thank you. Um, I was going to uh, bring up the, the question, um, some of the unpredictability of all of this and difficulty in reproducibility um, could be in part due to the lack of control of the materials themselves, both in terms of the purity of the of the uh, substances as well as the, their structure, uh, like, for example, the amorphous uh, nickel there. That's still a pretty random sort of thing. And you were talking about, you know, using really small samples. And one area you could get, use small samples but have more control would be to engage in some nanotechnology method where you deposit the palladium atoms atom by atom. Yes. And you could also put um, you know, infuse the deuterium atom by atom, uh, build up the structure and control it well that way. The other thing is using electric current to do the stimulation is in some ways uncontrolled also. And I was thinking something more along the lines of, you know, photon bombardment of some sort. And then in terms of examining what's, um, what's left over, you know, the, the reactants at the end, um, using like one of the synchrotron light sources to, um, you know, use the x-rays to, um, to really image what's left. Um, you know, do it before and after, I suppose. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, what the prospects of doing any of that might be in your mind. Every one of those suggestions is, is, is right on target, and the, the, uh, the only... Um thing that holds us back is, you know, money and manpower. Um, all of those things need to be done. In the early days, the electrochemistry was really the controlling factor, and the SRI group spent most of its effort on beating down the electrochemistry to the point that we had that more or less under control. Then the palladium became the problem, so we had to work with others to beat on the palladium, sometimes literally, to uh, do, have it uh, with a microstructure that we were looking for to give us reasonably reproducible effects, but once we really know what we're looking for, and that's where theory comes in, uh, once we've got a good theory, this is what, we, what, what you need to produce the effect, what is the best way to go out, forget what you've been doing in the past, what is the best way to create the, the structure that you need to, to maximize the effect, uh, and building it up atom by atom, you know, in, a, in a Feynman uh, type way, is obviously the uh, a logical way to move I mean, nanostructures may very well have a role. And the nice thing about very small particles of palladium is they, they load to one, one to one, easily. You know, you don't have to be a hero in order to load it. A big bar of palladium, it, it, the mechanical forces involved with insertion of the atoms into the lattice are such that you, it cracks, it, it, it rejects, but if you start with uh, much smaller structures, clusters, for example, so we're doing that as best we can by co-depositing. We put palladium salts into solution mm -hmm. to deposit them electrochemically while also uh, depositing deuterium. So the two of them uh, come together, form, and stabilize the structures, and that seems to work. Yeah. Um, it, it still seems like there's a lot of um, um, you know amorphous structure that's going on there, and so. Another thought I had in addition to the idea of atom by atom is uh, through techniques um, like utilizing graphene and materials like that, mm. it's possible to mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, people make, are using uh, zeolites, for example, yeah, to make, make templates. templates. You can make templates, essentially, Absolutely. That, to arrange atoms in the yeah, pattern yeah. you want. The other thing I was thinking is, in, you aren't um, um, controlling for, you know, cosmic rays, et cetera. And I remember from the days when, when there was a real problem with memories in computers, mm. there was the whole alpha particle issue right. for a while, and, and there were a lot of errors due to that. Um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, the sort of technique that are used in the uh, deep mine uh, neutrino experiments, things like that, to do whatever can be done to shield any possible, you know, because the muon catalyzed cold fusion right. is, is one example of where, right. hypothetically, that plays a part. Yeah, people have uh, run experiments in deep mines, Gran Sasso in uh, Italy and, and um, uh, some experiments here in, in uh, Utah, but doesn't seem to be the initiating factor. We've also spent time trying to correlate, you know, events that we've seen with cosmic ray uh, showers, and they're tabulated and known, so at a certain point we had the same sort of thought process and looked at it, and it didn't seem to be, um, you know, a... a, a a trigger, or, or the only trigger, or the most important trigger. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, things like even cloud formation in the atmosphere and, and rain seems to be sort Absol of absolutely correlated with that, but uh, unpredictable. But, okay. but Lucia, did you want to We say? have time for one more question oh. from this side, and then we are going to wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, after the early problems reproducing the experiments at Caltech and MIT, it was pretty much impossible for anybody to propose graduate work uh, in this field. I'm wondering if you see any change in that now with any of the recent results, or is it still uh, pretty much discredited at the universities? It's changing. Absolutely, it's changing. Uh, last week, I taught uh, Monday, Tuesday at a, a course, short course on cold fusion, or LENR, put on at uh, George Washington University, my old al alma mater, actually. And there were graduate students in the audience. Uh, Dave Nagel, formerly of the Naval Research Lab, is proposing a course, graduate course, on this uh, topic. So the stigma is still there, and the boot uh, uh, is still in. But um, you know we're you know nudging back a little bit, and they're getting older too. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all.